All right, I'm going to get us underway. Thanks for being here today uh, for the Centering Indigenous Knowledge webinar series for 2024. I'm Josh Vanek, and I'll be introducing our facilitator and, and host, Dr. Carla Bird, here in a moment. But just wanted to welcome folks and thank you for making time for this. Um, our We've got a, a bunch of folks helping us put on the series this year, and we want to just make sure we we thank the folks who have put some resources behind um, this idea uh, that we put together a couple of years ago. Um, for starters, we just uh, heard this week that Humanities Montana is going to fund the grant that we put together for them. So we want to acknowledge Humanities Montana and their support for this work, as well as the University of Montana Clearwater Credit Union, Reach Higher Montana, Montana State University, and RJS and Associates Inc. Um, all of these folks have been kind of with us since since last year, um, with the exception of Clearwater, who've come in this year, and we appreciate them uh, supporting supporting this idea. Um, I work for the Montana Campus Compact, and that's this network of higher ed institutions statewide um, that that come together and, and do events like this this series here. Um, I'm going to hand it off to you, Carla, and uh, get us underway. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Josh. Um, so I just wanted to welcome everyone to our Centering Indigenous Knowledge webinar series. Um, Montana Campus Compact is excited to return in 2024. This year's series will focus on the theme of Indigenous people in place and will explore people's millennia spanning relationships with and the significance of history, power, and place. Much like the series in 2023, Native languages will provide the world view to see and understand these relationships, which will be featured prominently in the discussions. We will draw upon the rich contributions of these vibrant institutions to raise awareness of their work to advance knowledge and perpetuate the culture of Montana, Montana's Indigenous people. Taryn Laskun is our featured artist and has designed the art piece for this webinar series called Reaffirming Ancient Beliefs. Taryn is a Begunny visual artist based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. His work is with various media, including printmaking, painting, photography, and ledger drawing. Taryn's work draws influence from color, shape, land, cosmos, cultural narratives, and experiences. Taryn has received his BFA in museum studies and an AFA in studio art from the Institute of American Indian Arts in 2016. He has received awards from the First Peoples Fund, 2020 Artist and Business Leadership Fellowship, Santa Fe Art, Art Institute 2018 Story Maps Fellowship, and Museum of Indian Arts and Culture 2016 Goodman Fellowship. Laskan was named one of the 2022 12 New Mexico Artists to now know in Southwest Contemporary. So here at Campus Compact, we would like to support and promote our Indigenous artists. And so if you are interested in learning more about Taryn's art, he does have his available art at TarynLaskun.com. So I'll hand it over to Taryn. Ah, um, six, 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 Carla, for those words. Uh, let me start by introducing myself. Oki Naksuko X, Nistuanoko Ksakwena Machka. Uh, Hello everyone, my name is Taryn Laskan. My Blackfoot name is Sakwe Namakka, which means Laskan. I'm a Pikani Nation citizen, also known as the Blackfeet Nation, and I'm a visual artist, uh, originally from Browning, Montana, but I now reside in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, I just want to thank the Montana uh, Campus Compact for inviting me, for also reaching out to uh, use my work uh, for this webinar. It's definitely, I'm thankful for that opportunity. My, and just to briefly 
I explain my work. Um, you know, the base, I, I consider my building blocks to my art practice to be uh, very basic elements to art. So shape, color are definitely a focus of my work, but line and texture, obviously with um, ledger drawing and ledger art, there's a lot of line work. And then basic concepts I work with um, that heavily influence my work are land, cosmos, cultural narratives, specifically Bikani or Nitsitapi, Blackfoot, and experiences, personal, um, collective, collectively, and even, you know, individual family members. All of those are sort of the, the foundation to my practice. Uh, a lot of my work is influenced by Blackfoot Painted Lodges. And so that's where I'm getting some of my geometric aesthetics. And because there's a lot of geometric shapes that represent mountains, uh, trails, the constellations, um, you know, birds, animals, different types of figures. And, and there's all these cultural narratives and stories tied to those. And so my, me being a visual artist, um, I'm, I'm really interested in re researching those, you know, those are come from my own cultural heritage, being Picani, being part of the Blackfoot Confederacy um, and being from Montana. And so a lot of those backgrounds to me, personal backgrounds influence my work. And then painted hides. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in war art, coup stories, winter counts. A lot of this has pictorial imagery. So I'm, I'm working with this sort of ancient way of visually documenting that has been in North America for tens of thousands of years. And so that I'm just, I feel I'm continuing some of this um, abstraction some of this geometric abstraction, indigenous abstraction, Bikani abstraction, that's what my work is um, is continuing on. And some of the um, other types of you know influences I have are rock art, petroglyphs, pictographs. I'm very much interested in Blackfoot archaeology of Montana and Alberta. Uh, as you know, Bikani people of Montana, we've been we never were relocated or displaced. We're still in our traditional territory that we've been in for thousands of years. And so a lot of that reflects my work. I'm very interested in the the human story of North America and, and how, just how much um, experiences are tied to the land, tied to Montana landscape, tied to Alberta. And, and so that's what I, I, I'm very much interested in and inspired by those um, types of topics and, and genres and movements. And for people who want to learn more about my work, Carla mentioned it earlier. Uh, my website is just www.terranlaskan.com. Uh, there you can find galleries I work with, uh, also exhibitions that I am have coming up or past exhibitions. Uh, that's a great source to that'll lead you to my social medias, to my galleries and to my happenings. And um, lastly, I would just like to uh, say, you know, I have a solo exhibitioning, exhibition opening at the um, Hockaday Museum of Art in Kalispell. That opens April 4th. Uh, I'll be flying out there at the end of the month to install a mural. And I have uh, 29 works in that show, plus the mural once I do that. So if you are in the local area, um, and you have time, check that out. I'll be doing an artist talk that Thursday as well. And the show will be on view until June 21st. And so uh, there's some time to, to see it. But I just want to thank again, Carla, Josh, and Pete, who have all supported me um, over the last few years and who have who have been you know great collaborators in terms of me providing imagery for this. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really all I have to say. This is just this, this work that I provided for the webinar, uh, can symbolize, you know, rings, uh, a lot, I've been working with this semicircle shape. And so I think people automatically think rainbow, but for me, it's, you know, when you have a lodge cover laid out on the plains, on the ground, it creates this really cool semicircle sh shape. And so I've worked with that. 
you know, if you look at Blackfoot painted lodges, we have rings on the top. They symbolize trails. They symbolize ripples. Um, they symbolize the sky world, Blackfoot cosmology. And so this is, um, you know, taking some of those ancient symbols, but using them more in modern ways and, and really uh, simplifying uh, just different shapes I'm, I'm drawn to. And, and so again, like the conical shape of a lodge or a teepee, but I prefer to call them lodge laid out on the ground. You know, there's just such cool shapes that it creates laid out flat, but then when it's actually a lodge is constructed, you know, it has that conical shape, that structure. Um, those are, I'm just really drawn to these geometric shapes that are either flat or three-dimensional. So uh, thank you again for giving me the time to explain some of my work. And I, I really hope this webinar goes great for everyone involved. Thank you, Taryn. And so the website for Taryn's website is in the chat box. So feel free to go and visit his work. Um, and also a reminder that we will be having this webinar series the next uh, three Thursdays. And so join us for Dr. Anita Moore, as well as Aspen Decker and some of our tri tribal college students. Um, and so our presenter uh, for today is Dakota Lajanus. Uh, he is Cheyenne and his Cheyenne name is Rides to the Sky. He was born in Billings and grew up there as well as Busby, Lame Deer and Bozeman. He is a member of the Northern Cheyenne Nation um, and also acknowledges uh, his descendant nations, Mandan, Hidatsa, Arikara, Pawnee, and Lakota. On the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation, Dakota grew up within families and with extended relatives who were part of the traditional ceremonial federation. That rich environment provided Dakota a foundation for grasping and developing a command of cultural practices and languages. Dakota's college studies began at Chief Dalknife and spanned to Dartmouth College, where he completed a bachelor's degree in geography, international social and economic development with a minor in Native American studies. He departed New England after that and returned to Bozeman and Montana State University, where he completed biomedical science and Native American studies courses as a post bac student. Dakota was asked to guest lecture for the Native American studies and English departments discussing literature, language, lived experience, and ethnography. In Bozeman, Dakota was very fortunate to be surrounded by relatives friends and mentors who fostered an environment of culturally focused academic pursuits, advocacy and service. In 2012, he was hired to be a consultant and voice actor with Montana PBS in conjunction with Channel 13 NYC PBS for a role playing game project, which became his touchstone, touchstone moment for combining virtual learning environments and indigenous history, culture and language. The project called Cheyenne Odyssey combined those cultural childhood and adolescent learning experience with facets of current technology, media design and production, and intercultural consultation. These emerging technological experiences bring a new arena of discourse for virtual indigenous connotations of people and place. So I'll hand it over to Dakota. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. Um, okay, I'm just the nervousness hit like an hour ago, so I tell people, uh, just uh, bear with me. It like dawned on me, you know, as I was getting ready for this uh, presentation here. Uh, let's see here. Um, so yeah, I want to thank everybody, uh, Dr. Bird, uh, Josh, uh, Pete, um, for the opportunity uh, to present here and all the sponsors here. Um, this is a very new experience for me. Um, you know, Carl had asked if I wanted to be involved. Uh, with this project here. Um, I work at uh, Missoula College at the University of Montana, and I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a mainline advisor. So, you know, being involved uh, with cultural programming, uh, such as Campus Compact, Centering Indigenous Knowledge, um, you know, it's very fortunate and new experience for me uh, to share that, you know, to kind of have a forum here in Missoula, um, like I did uh, when I was in Bozeman there. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna do today is demonstrate, you know, the language itself, uh, my experiences with the language, 
um, and also the Shine uh, the Shine Odyssey project, which came about, uh, I believe it was in like May or March of twenty or sorry March of April twenty twelve when I was acknowledged or contacted to um, participate in the program if I wanted to participate. Um, and I just want to say like right now there's a lot of uh, you know like Taryn's artwork. There's a lot of you know uh, angles. There's a lot of hoops that are kind of opening and closing around us all the time. And, you know, right now I do, uh, you know, acknowledge everybody here and I acknowledge uh, relatives uh, from the Cheyenne tribe and also from uh, from college, from Dartmouth, from New England. One of my uh, one of my uh, two of my classmates are uh, tuning into this presentation. I don't think we have seen each other uh, in years, uh, but, you know, there is and also from Bozeman as well. So I feel like all these uh, all these. Uh, these tangents, all these ellipses that are kind of circling back around, uh, you know, in this very moment. And so uh, that is kind of why I'm nervous because like, I, you know, you're kind of in the center of this story of, of where things are are constantly reemerging, you know, where things close and then they're just going to start over again, you know, as time goes on. So, um, so I'll kind of, you know, stop there and uh, kind of, kind of transition to um, the story of how I actually became a, a, a very late speaker of the language, um, and I and I prepared a script for that. Um, and I do tell people like you know I have um, so the title of uh, of this piece you know of my presentation. Uh, so in Cheyenne, it's not not this not this not this hasin, and that means like I'm rebuilding the fire. Um, but there's also a more human that 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 uh, that. Uh, implies that you're building it with others. Um, so, so it's kind of a very compact word, uh, which native languages are known for, um, you know, but when you expand it out to English, there's a lot of context, you know, so English kind of has to work kind of almost overtime, you know, to really capture the essence of like small word clusters, you know, like Cheyenne. Um, so, uh, you know, and as Carla said, yeah, I do, uh, you know, where, where I was from, where I grew up, where I live, um, you know, right now, you know, this area, um, I guess in the language, you know, we, uh, you know, Missoula can have a place name. Uh, it's Gagotsia Taneno, like flathead people place, um, you know, it's just kind of, you know, or, uh, but I know this area, it, how would I say that? You know, we would say, like, you know, what the Western, the mountain uh, Indians, this is, you know, their territory. So, um so it's kind of where I acknowledge where I, where I am now, um, you know, and so, uh, you know, the language I've come to start deriving a lot of words, um, you know, like I told Carla, I needed to come up with a word for Bozeman, you know, there's no word for Bozeman in Shine language, but, you know, the natural landscape, what is featured is the Missouri River, you know, the headwaters uh, of the Missouri River, Missouri River. So in Cheyenne, we would say, like where, where the Missouri River begins um, is kind of, you know, where a name that I came up uh, for, you know, for the Bozeman area. So, um, so I've, I've shared this story colloquially with a lot of people throughout the years, you know, kind of formalizing it and kind of uh, encap encapsulating it in the language um, has been a new experience for me. It kind of brought me back to when I was a small child. Um, so I'm just going to do, you know, I'm just going to dive into the story as is. Um, it's not the most grammatically concise story. I, I tell, I just told uh, one of uh, my niece who was part of the story that um you know that my fluency in the language is probably that of an early adolescent um i've just kind of uh you know i i ended up setting the language down more or less for about eight years uh from 2013 up until fall of 2021 um i just never really used the language never thought in it you know i lived elsewhere i moved out of montana i lived in oklahoma i was in the military and then i lived in boise so um, but it was in fall of 21 where I kind of came back to the language uh, because my niece started asking uh, for help, uh, you know, and so I had to really brush off a lot of uh, a lot of the cobwebs, get those cleared out of my mind, uh, you know, and just kind of come back to the language after that time, you know, and in that time, much has changed, you know, with the Cheyenne language. Uh, many speakers have been lost since since then. You know, I think now our, our sure count is probably around 275 uh, fluent speakers. Um, so, you know, the language we are it is kind of fate it's it's almost it's facing the odds but you know like i'll talk about you know later in the presentation you know the help of, of technology um you know making those uh you know informed and, and useful for for topics and, and projects like you know like indigenous language revitalization um i feel like those you know are lending a hand um 
So, but back to the story, you know, of, of how I was younger and kind of what I noticed, you know, I tell what the story is about, you know, is that I noticed that my grandparents only spoke English when they knew that I was around. Uh, I used to stay with them a lot in their house uh, outside Busby in a place it's called Ono Nino, and that means redistrict. And so what that refers to is that people who settled that area were of mixed Cheyenne and also Mandan Hidatsa Rikra heritage. So the name kind of fits, you know, my ancestry and then where the place of like exact place where I live uh, on the reservation. So, um, so I'll dive into the story. It's I, I've sent snippets of this story to Carla, to my niece, to other people. But to like be in this forum, I, I feel like I'm like, you know, I'm definitely feeling the nervousness. Um, but, you know, I just uh, have to like calm down real quick. And then I'll kind of break into the story. People will notice that my cadence will change. Um, you're going to notice that just the tone of voice, my tonality, my pitch and like rhythm are going to slow down. Uh, you know, because native languages do have their own sound systems, they have their own melodies. Um, you know, in English, I think we're used to talking fast. And so, you know, I need to kind of transition my mind to break into, you know, the language, uh, things that need to be stressed, uh, things, you know, that that I need to just emphasize. Um, so I'll break into this now. Um, and I am very nervous. I have never done this before. I've never shared, you know, a demonstrated project of the language uh, at all uh, until, until today. So everybody's seeing this, uh, you know, happen in real time. Um, and so I'll just kind of start here. It'll start with a greeting and, and kind of just, you know, introducing myself uh, in Cheyenne culture. You know, we introduce our we introduce ourselves, where we're from. We have two different concepts of where we're from and where, where we were born and where we live. Um, you know, so um, so that's kind of, uh, you know, how we introduce ourselves in the language. We also mention our families. So um, I'll kind of do that. Uh, I'll, I'll start now. So now we'll start in here warm up. So those are like the four families I come from on, on the reservation there. Uh, two from my dad's side and two from my mother's side. Um, like Echovatov is Billings and Wopumitan is uh, Busby is the modern name for it. Nahist is like that's where that's where I'm from. That's where uh, I was born. That's where I I'm that's where I it's a weird word. It's like where I'm I'm likened um, is, is the word how to say that. So um, let's see here. So I'll kind of start out here. You know, I, I've been list, I've kind of recount, recalling how elders uh, begin uh, talks in public. You know, there's definitely a protocol there of, you know, what you're going to do, what your purpose is. Um, so this script will kind of start out like that here. Ishif um, Ishif ne Amit na hit na nazi tanot, ti tisinist, na hoke, na hoke hebi yurts, for the ma him ma hyonif, uh, im hyonif, uh, imist na nak na imist nak na se ato wo na na hit of se hats, uh, amit na na vatne at, uh, tisinist, na sa tisto ane. Uh, na na imos hinit na it. college. Uh, uh, it, 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 
na e wo wist the most sane na na tisnest e ho wanted us na ti hoston sistof na na ti na ti ti hoston sistof na ti hoston sist hoston sistof na wist mo na wist na wist na wist me amet na ta ne na 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 as wo a one o ma o wabenaki new england um they say uh not not that's the odds um the the hostonist uh now what emits knocking it now to the sinist uh much it say han uh not about it to sinist not harm me your uh if if this if this to my sister not the war uh in money but with the most sunny uh he did that now if this hope has him <laughs> all right so so in that story that I talk about, it is a little choppy. I'm a little more relaxed when I'm just like saying it to one person here. Um, so, you know, in the language here, I said, and what that means is like, I became a little mouse. Um, you, you know, uh, so like I, I had to sneak around uh, with my grandparents. So uh, so Nishki is grandmother, Namshim is, is uh, grandfather. Um, so, you know, they have both passed as well. So what I was describing in that story was that, you know, I I woke up one day, that one time I woke up, uh, with, uh, not, not, uh, not shishio, it's like that one time I woke up, um, you know, nasi ofin nods it, like I suddenly realized, um, you know, that they switched languages, um, Cheyenne and English, um, when I would stay with them, when I would be inside their house. Um, and so, you know, I said like, when I would be in front of them, you know, physically in front of them, um, they only spoke English, you know, they didn't speak Cheyenne. So, um, so what I, what I says, like, you know, like, like I was a little mouse inside their house. <laughs> it's like what, what that describes, you know, uh, no is like, I, I regularly, um, uh, listen to them very, uh, very secretly, um, you know, very intently and very, in, uh, just very, uh, you know, not drawing attention to myself is kind of how I, you know, I could, that word could also be translated. Um, like I never gave up. I kept at it. Like they, like every time I'd stay with them, I would always like basically just stay in my, in, in their spare bedroom, uh, stay, you know, in that room um, and just listen to them talk. Um, I never really knew what they were saying, um, but I definitely absorbed uh, the pronunciations of the language, uh, the cadence and the melody, um, but I had to learn it in, in secret, you know, because, you know, I, I do remind, you know, uh, ones like uh, my niece, who is a Shine language instructor at Chitaal Knife now, um, that 30 years ago, you know, this stuff was not really, um, how we hold it in high regard now, it was not always held in, in that regard, you know, that, that it was very strange for a, a child 30 years ago to be speaking the language or learning it, you know, or to be exposed to it intently, um, you know, so I kind of had to navigate that and, and I call it, you know, now call it like an act of defiance uh, because, you know, if I remember one time, one of my uncles, he's all, he's one of my late uncles, he realized what I was doing um, and he looked at me and he, he said, it's just an ist. He's like, do you speak Cheyenne? Like, cause, cause I laughed when he and my grandma laughed. And, and so he kind of realized like he, he looked at me, you know, that, and, and that's when he asked me that, you know, cause he realized like I was like listening intently, you know, to him. Um, and so, um, you know, so not issue, it's like I grew up, you know, not my like I finished high school and I did was like, like college or university. Um, you know, and I'm on a like I became a student again, you know, uh, like a, like a higher student in, in college here. Um, when is the, the shy name of Adeline Spotted Out, she's also passed. Um, as it gets very painful for me to talk about because like all these people are gone, you know, that, that I, that have shaped my influence in the language and have taught me things. Um, but Adeline spotted out, you know, like that's her, her English name, you know, uh, one hawks, it's a, it's a, it's like that's her Cheyenne name. Um, not able with the most sunny, like she was my teacher, you know, um, you know, of the Cheyenne language, um, you know, a Nazi host on Nazi so uh is like uh in terms of it means like uh reading the language uh like reading it uh and uh is like is like in terms of writing it 
um now like novel novel wisdom myth is that is that what that means is like she taught me how to read and write the language uh because i didn't have up until then uh my knowledge of language is just very purely oral verbal uh never knew how to spell things even now there's a word i'll i'll know a word that i can remember and i don't know how to spell it i'll find it in the dictionary i'm like i have no idea that's how the word would have been spelled you know because uh those things become very um you know how i think the language sounds isn't exactly how they're shaped in this orthography so you know um so being able to kind of read and write the language you know uh adeline spotted elk was the one who taught me she uh was a um uh, a shine language instructor at Chiton Life College. Um, she had received her class seven certification, which was housed under. Uh, so this kind of came on the heels of Indian Education for All when the state passed um, an act in '99 to actually f formally fund uh, the mandate there that was put in place in the 1972 uh, state constitutional convention. Um, so uh, so new speakers, you know, were given a platform how to become certified. Um, you know, to become speakers uh, and teachers of language and culture. So Adeline Spadanov was one of the first. Um, who were part of that cohort at Chief Don Life College. So she had an associate's degree in, in early childhood education. So um, so she combined herself, you know, her, her fluency in the language. And she also acknowledged that, you know, this program had brought her back into the language, you know, that she had stopped speaking it for a long time. She lived elsewhere, just did other things in life. And so she acknowledged herself, you know, to us that um, her, um, that this program way back in 2001, 2002 had brought her back, in, you know, into the language there. Um, so, so she taught me, you know, how to read and write it, you know, and then I also say, uh, like, is like I, 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 I scattered about, um, you know, after that, Amit like in time I scattered about, I, I left, you know, I went to New England, uh, started school at Dartmouth college. Um, but I always had the knowledge of, uh, learning, knowing how to read and write the language, you know, and, and I didn't mention this in the story, you know, but my mother, uh, and late grandmother, you know, they, um, they are fluent speakers and so i would often call home uh so back then 20 you know, 20 years ago there was no uh, facebook you know there's nothing the modern platforms we have now you know didn't exist back then um you maybe had like chat video messenger video yahoo chat you know run it back uh, old school um AOL, you know aol instant messenger but i used to call home a lot um and ask my you know ask my mother or, or mother or my uh, my aunts as well um, you know, how to say certain words, how to spell them, how to translate. So the language still had a presence in my life, uh, despite being thousands of miles away. Um, so, um, so that, you know, childhood adolescent experience um, wouldn't have happened if Adeline was not there, if I didn't choose to, uh, to stay home for another year. Um, you know, in that year that I stayed home to help my family, uh, we had, we, uh, my grandfather had died uh, that year. Um, so I chose to stay home. Dartmouth uh, respected my request to defer. Um, but I was kind of left with like, well, what do I do? It's like, okay, I'm just, I'm going to, I cannot, I have to stay in school, so, you know, in some form. So I, uh, you know, had already attended Don Life College as a junior uh, student in high school. So, um, so transitioned, you know, to being a general study student there. Um, and then it's like, hey, cool, try and language, I'll sign up, you know, I'll, you know, kind of know what this is about, um, you know, and, and so that for me was when I started to gain a knowledge of reading and writing the language. Uh, most fluent speakers aren't literate in the language, and I and reinforce the point that they don't have to be, you know, that they learned this language just through pure oral immersion, you know, when they were, when they were younger and, and, you know, and in early childhood. So, um, so reading and writing language is still, uh, it's, it's just in the hands of a few, but, um, for me, you know, I've definitely have come to become uh, comfortable to read and write the language. Um, it, it misses some finer details. You know, I, I do acknowledge that, you know, if you were to grade, you know, my speech in my proficiency in language, I'd be like a B, B minus student. It's like, but that's perfectly fine. You know, I uh, have forgotten a lot of the language, but I'm I'm keen and very uh, open with what I can still, you know, remember and how I can be functional uh, in the language here. So, um but yeah, so that came on the heels, you know, of, uh, as Carlos said, I returned uh, to Montana State University. Um, and Bozeman was kind of, you know, where I became um, literate in the language, where I continued uh, the, these, uh, continued becoming literate in the language. Um, then I was also asked uh, to, um, you know, time went on, you know, I uh, took some NES classes, uh, and then I got invited to, I went to an international poetry competition at one point in Bozeman, and I was the only entry for an indigenous language. And so um, that uh, poetry competition was actually facil facilitated by an MSU uh, 
writing instructor professor there. So um, so I learned to read and write in the language uh, and kind of imported that into uh, these guest lecturers that I often help in NES and English classes. So um, and I had friend, friends and relatives there. Um, you know, one of my aunts, uh, Francine Spang Willis, you know, she helps me a lot still with she's an old historian uh, by training. Uh, so, you know, relatives like her and then my aunt Lisa Lone Fight uh, from Newtown, North Dakota, they all really formed this cocoon for me, you know, that was very uh, rich with cultural experiences, cultural knowledge, cultural background uh, from both my, you know, tribe that, you know, the Cheyenne, but also uh, my aunt is from North Dakota, from Menan, Hadatsa, and Rikro Nation. So, um, so I grew up in this, kind of re-grew up in this cocoon, you know, at Bozeman there, um, you know, friends, relatives, families, and mentors as well. Um, you know, and I also completed an independent study with um, a professor there, Dr. Uh, Larry why am I forgetting his last name? Dr. Larry Gross. Um, he is now at University of Redlands. Um, so he and I took an independent study class um, uh, because he's he's a Anishinaabe. And so Anishinaabe and Cheyenne, they are related languages, uh, not intelligible really to any degree. Um, but we took an independent study. And, and the text that I had uh, for that class was uh, Blackfoot Physics, which was written uh, by uh, a late uh, British uh, theoretical physicist. But he writes about his experiences uh, on the Blackfoot Reserves in Canada. Um, you know, and Cheyenne language is also mentioned in there just because the language family, you know, how these languages are verb based, uh, you know, and how that really intrigues uh, like theoretical physicists, you know, it's like, what is a verb based language, you know, English is noun based, um, you know, but what's a verb based language, you know, and it's just, and, and I, I've uh, told my niece who I do help, uh, you know, still in the language, we have conversations that everything is a verb, uh, you know, in, in languages like, Chey uh, in Algonquin languages like uh, uh, Ch uh, Cheyenne and Blackfeet, Ojibwe and Cree. Um, and so we kind of, uh, so I kind of gained a foothold of like higher level um, moorings, you know, within the language there. Um, so, so that class was also pivotal as well, uh, because, um, you know, I brought kind of imported, you know, what I knew about the language and, and Dr. Gross and I, and another student, uh, her name is Barbara, we uh, talked about placemaking, uh, how, you know, how tribal people made place. Um, you know, Barbara is from the Netherlands, so she kind of brought this perspective, you know, from the other side of uh, the Atlantic there. So we definitely, you know, kind of foster this environment of like place and language, how people make sense of place. Um, so um, so that book was very pivotal uh, for me to kind of gain this higher, uh, you know, knowledge of the language. And I also um, started to learn to learn about how, what other languages Cheyenne is related to. Um, you know, Blackfeet is one of them. They're not intelligible, but um, I've told Carla and Taryn as well that, you know, we do have a lot of similar stories, um, you know, similar, uh, you know, uh, facets of place, you know, that they're still very similar. Um, and that's always intrigued me. You know, I, I'll often uh, kind of study Blackfeet if I can. Um, I'll find a word or here or there that's, um, that's uh, familiar at least. Uh, one of them is Barry. I think in, in uh, Blackfoot it's mini, mini uh, and in, in Cheyenne it's uh, mints or min. So there's like a word or the here or there that I'll come across that's you know recognizable. Um, so you know in Bozeman, what that culminated to was um, th this uh, project uh, with Cheyenne Odyssey. So uh, Montana PBS is based on the MSU campus, and so um, this project I'm still. I'm unclear how it landed. I one of the uh, producers from Channel 13, uh, the New York City uh, PBS station, had come across a text, had come across something about the north, the Northern Cheyenne, and so that uh, culminated into them, you know, formalizing a story that they proposed, um, you know, to to produce. Um, and so I met with uh, the main production team in Bozeman, and then from there we actually drove down to Langdeer. Uh, to Cheetah Life College. So again, there was kind of a loop there going back to Cheetah Life College after all that time. Um, and uh, so we met, you know, with the cultural team there, um, met with the former president of the Cheetah Life College, Dr. Richard Little Bear. Um, so we met with the cultural staff as well. Um, and that turned into, you know, they, you know, kind of gave, they gave the green light. And so we, uh, the team studied archives. I was formally hired as a voice actor and producer, uh, or not producer, consultant, um, and kind of a production consultant or production assistant, I should say. Um, so I was always on call uh, for a certain amount of time there uh, to answer questions they had, um, you know, uh, just to kind of guide the the producers and the team there of, of you know, that this is about a, hist a historical event, um, but, you know, ultimately some parts did have to be uh, fiction. 
uh, you know, the names and, but the main, uh, you know, the main, um, the main uh, categories are there. So what I'll do is kind of share my screen just so people will know what I'm talking about. So um, the actual like facilitation team is called Mission US. And so they have kind of a, they were the ones who facilitated this, um, this project here. So I will kind of share my screen here just so people will see. Let's see. All right. All right. So can people see that? Yep, we can. Okay. See it. All right. So yeah, so Mission US uh, partnered with uh, Channel 13, uh, New York City PBS. And so they, um, you know, were curious about how this story went down. And so things were, were fitting to some degree, because I do descend uh, from the historical Cheyenne Odyssey um, back uh uh, you know, after the Battle of the Little Big Corps on June 25th, 1876, um, uh, you know, the Shine were kind of on the run there. And so, um, so uh, one of my grandmothers, uh, who was born three days after the Battle of the Little Big Corn, she was born near what's now Lodge Grass, Montana. Um, she uh, grew up uh, in that Odyssey. I mean, it lasted about three years from 18, November 1876 to, I believe, April 1879. Um, you know, the Shine were removed to Oklahoma um, in uh, about 900, and then about 300 or so uh, made the trek up north, uh, basically just started walking one day, you know, whatever they had. Uh, I think they had a few horses there. Um, so, you know, so the story was definitely close to home for me because, you know, descending from that, you know, my grandmother, you know, she was just a toddler, you know, she was one, two, three, uh, two years old in that time. This was in the winter. This was like, I think, November 18. 78. And so, um, you know, it was this harsh winter of, uh, you know, of, of this band of, of uh, Cheyenne that were just marching up north, you know, and kind of skirmishing with the military. Um, you know, eventually they split off. Uh, my grandmother was in a, was split off and uh, her, that band wintered in what are called the Sand Hills of Nebraska uh, in Western Kansas, Western Nebraska. So, um, and then she lived, you know, until 1969. So she lived to the modern day um, there are photos of her that I see around from time to time. My mom and older aunts can remember her. Um, but yeah, she lived to be about 93 years old. So she definitely saw life, you know, unfold, especially the pre-reservation times. Um, the irony in that is that she's actually a granddaughter of U.S. Army, uh, French Canadian U.S. Army soldiers. So I tell, you know, telling these uh, historical stories, you know, that you don't often don't come across, you know, um, in history books and Native American studies, you know, that there are always tangents and loops everywhere that kind of loop back around, you know, as time goes on. So, um, so, you know, in this play here, I became, uh, I was Little Fox. I was the main uh, character as an adult. Um, so you will hear my voice in there. It's often uh, cringy to me because I, I tell myself I need to just forgive myself because I was still working, you know, still kind of coming into play here. Um, and definitely what aided, you know, my development and, and uh, in this, in this work, uh, was at Dartmouth College. I did complete uh, classical training, classical acting uh, training courses, and also uh, a voice for theater class there. Um, so um, that kind of mixed, you know, with this knowledge of the language that I had. So things kind of coalesce um, today that really helped me to uh, to speak the language but, and stay knowledgeable of it as well and present on it. So, so yeah, I was uh, Little Fox here as the main character. And so with, with RPG games, you know, you definitely, uh, you, you find a cast and crew, uh, or you find you find that there's this cast of characters, and um, so with RPG, like you you know you make choices in there. You um, you know it kind of explains a lot of uh, details and context of history that you know that often are kind of missed. And so um, students you know who play this game are faced with these different tasks, faced with different uh, situations there. Um, so yeah, this was kind of the band. Uh, so there's Little Fox, um, Calling Bird, and then um, so you know this also entailed a lot of. Um, um a lot of involvement uh, with with other northern Cheyenne um yeah uh, blue feather she is a uh, her voice is a uh, my relative Marsha small uh, who uh, is a student at MSC Bozeman um so and then there's also uh, a younger cast of, of children and so a group of children from Lanbier uh, Elementary School are actually um were actually um taken to Bozeman so we all recorded in the same uh, voice production studio there um, so, you know, those students got to learn how this stuff works. Um, definitely was a lot of fun, you know, to hear children, um, you know, being exposed to new things. Um, yeah, I think there were about 10 or 15 students uh, in that in that class there. 
Um, so yeah, and uh, let's see here. I know this website, I know you kind of sometimes have to. So I need the characters. Let's see where this goes. Okay. So yeah, so let's see this little fox. Um, but I want to go back to you know the production team here, kind of some backgrounds here. Um, let's see. Just some details. I remember finding this at one point and I cannot find it anymore. Let's see, teacher's guy. So yeah, so this is kind of the team, how this all happened here. Uh, there's me back in the day. Um, there's the production crew at Chief Left College. Um, and then this picture is of the Battle of the Little Bighorn as well. So that event is tied into the you know the Shine Odyssey there. Um, so we had these professional advisors here, you know, the PIs and things like that, who definitely looked over and, and oversaw all the production uh, content there, making sure it was culturally informed, historically informed as well. Um, and then... Uh, I never met most of these people. They were uh, all based in New York City here. Um, this is the main animation uh, production team here. Um, I met just a few of them, David Langenden as well. I uh, met him, worked with him a lot. Uh, but all these people were based back in New York City. So um, so here I am uh, under my old name uh, as a cultural consultant. The producer is uh, Chris Siever at Montana PBS. Um, and the one who actually got me in contact with Chris Siever uh, was uh, Jennifer uh, Woodcock Medicine Horse. Uh, she is an instructor at uh, MSU last that I knew. Um, so she, you know, came across kind of uh, this networking uh, opportunity there that, um, you know, presented itself for me. And after a meeting with them, decided, you know, this was, uh, you know, also uh, it was a feasible project here. Uh, and then it's also so she's down at college, uh, Mina Seminole. She's like the cultural uh, uh, center director there uh, in Lane Deer. And then Josette Woodenlegs was also there at the time. Um, so, you know, I definitely felt. You know this, and then these are all uh, the different uh, cast members here. Uh, they're a mix of, uh, you know, mostly Cheyenne, and then there's a few others. Uh, you know, Michael and Eddie Spears are from. I think they're from Lower Brule. Uh, they do live in Bozeman, as far as I know. Um, but yeah, so there's other relatives, you know, other relatives and people that uh, came to be part of this story here. Uh, Dr. Richard Littleberry, you know, is their na narrator there. Um, so yeah, this is kind of how this all came together here um, with with the project. Um, but yeah, people are welcome to you know check this out if you want. Uh, I don't know. I can post this in the chat. Uh, Mission US mission usorg um, So let me copy this here. But yeah, people can check this out. You know, and um, and you know the reviews of this are still they're favorable. You know, that's always a nervous thing because you're like, what is the reception to this? Um, but you know, the reception is still um, you know it's been highly rated there. And so for me, it's it's been a uh, you know it's it's uh, been a project that for me, you know, has come into to play to be, you know, kind of a touchstone moment, um, you know, being able to be part of the project, you know, on the production side, but also as a voice actor, um, and also being descended, you know, from this event here. Um, so that's kind of uh, where things kind of came into play here, um, you know, with with the play here. And I know the music here, um, they, they, so Joseph Firecrow as uh, one of my late uncles, he's also passed, um, but he was also a descendant uh, of, we're both common descendants of that, uh, of our ancestral grandmother who was born just days after the battle of the, the Little Bighorn. So, um, so that's kind of what, you know, talking, talking about that today, um, how, you know, what, how this kind of was a little uh, prelude to the use of modern technology, um, you know, to help indigenous language and cultural uh, revitalizations. And so, um, so that's kind of where I'm at today. Um, you know, uh, Chitana of College, my niece, uh, her shy name is Meiyo. She is um, um, a new instructor there at the college. So we are in almost daily contact. She'll ask me about translations, you know, but she has her, those fluent speakers who help her out. I kind of, I'm kind of a middle step um, because, you know, I tell her like, I'm probably like an adolescent level speaker of the language still, even though I'm, I'm 40 years old. So, um, so that's kind of uh, what, how the language is, is kind of been returned, you know, to me, you know, in the script, you know, I mentioned, you know, I'd say, um, you know, I'd, I'd say, and I said, like, like uh, in time, you know, I, I returned to the language, um, you know, not hum is like my niece. And that what that means is like my sister's daughter. Um, it's a very specific kinship term. Uh, you know, like she, she needed help. Um, you know, with the language there. So she kind of brought me back there. Um, and she and I, along with uh, one of my other relatives, um, we are, it's still in the very formulative stages here, but she is working on, um, working on um, 
we are working on a, a virtual reality uh, language environment and program for the language there. So um, we are still, that's still very formulative. Um, nothing's really been announced. Um, you know, it's kind of a blank slate for both of us or for all three of us, because, uh, you know, we do have, uh, they have their master's degree. I have a bachelor's. I'm like, I'm like, you know, I'm in the background, but I'm always ready to help there. So, um, you know, we're still formulating a help with, with a, a Anishinaabe, a linguist there. So, um, who is going to guide the program on that, on the, you know, level of, of pedagogy, um, to, you know, for us to do this in the right way, that's culturally in, in, informed, um, historically informed as well. So, you know, in that VR project, you know, we do envision like we'll have environments, you know, or landscapes where students will be able to traverse, you know, and know the names of plants, know the names of, you know, landscapes, know the sky and the stars as well. Um, so, and there's also an upcoming project that my niece is working on, uh, Star Stories with MSU Billings. So they're getting fluent speakers to, uh, tell these stories and narrate them, uh, and that will be in a planetarium. So, um, so you know, there's kind of a rekindling of you know of, of uh, at least with my niece and, and my cousin, you know, that we can we're we're helping to rebuild this fire, you know, with the language, especially given the current number of fluent speakers of the language there. Um, so, um, so that's kind of where I'll leave that off to be. Um, but yeah, Shine Odyssey is. Um, is uh, the, that main you know project the touchstone moment there of where we were just able to bring this team out from New York City, um, you know, to really immerse them, you know, because they were able to read the history books, you know, know that history, but also to be in the space, um, you know, where these events took place, where people live, but especially where the descendants of these people still remain and where we live, you know, that that um, we are we are alive, you know. Uh, um, you know, not so it's in like we're still here, you know, that that, you know, those uh, historical people had descendants, you know, um, and and that we're alive and we are still, you know, working on, um, you know, this this these facets of revitalization uh, with language and culture. So. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, Mission U.S. is the, the main uh, was the main producer of, of this uh, story here. So. And I think uh, that's about it. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody has any questions or, or there's any comments there, um, you know, but uh, this is definitely new, you know, things like VR, um, AI, you know, is also a current uh, conversational topic with re with revitalize, revitalizing into just languages. Um, that's still a very hot topic, you know, people like, how do you go about that, you know, so, uh, but the language project that I'm working on, you know, at this time and in the future is, is solely virtual reality, so um, AI is definitely another step there, and I know some people are, uh, indigenous scholars are working on that as well, so. All right, let me, I'll stop sharing this here. Thanks so much, Dakota. And yeah, let's yeah see we're you. very happy to. Can you can you all see the screen, or did it turn off? It might have turned off. Let's see. Oh no, I'm still screen sharing. Okay, let me turn this off here. Yeah, it's it's still up. Okay, uh, all right, there we go. All right. Yeah, it looks like um, so we're getting we're starting to see some uh, questions pop in in the Q and A section, and I can just read these if you want to respond. Um, you know, uh, you don't have to read and type or anything. Um, oh yeah, I can but, see them. Yeah, I can see them. Let's see here. Yeah, I see the one from Cheyenne. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Let's see here. Um, let's see. Yeah, for Cheyenne, let me see. Let me just respond to this real quick. All right, so I responded to Cheyenne then. Let's see here. All right. Uh, Shasta Tallbull just asked, said, we can't see the questions. Can you read the question? So, so far it's been mostly thanks for- Yeah, uh, hasn't been any hard uh, questions there. Let's see here. Um, so Angela Cooper, uh, how does the uh, removal impact language and understanding place? Um, so to kind of answer that, like, um, 
you know, the Cheyenne were, were placed uh, in Montana, uh, kind of by arbitrary means by General Nelson Miles. And he was a, a general and even in retirement, he, you know, kind of uh, took up for the Cheyenne to kind of stay in Montana. Um, but our, you know, our language really pertains uh, to like the Black Hills, uh, even down to the Denver area. You know, like uh, we, um, Bithani Ohit is like uh, Tallow River, but that means the South Platte River that flows, you know, through modern day Denver. Um, and a lot of our languages does pertain to um, the woodlands, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, even Ontario. Um, so, um, so there's a lot of the language that pertains that these words are kind of forgotten about, but, um, you know, they do pertain to like the earlier habitations of, of the, the ancestral Cheyenne people, um, you know, some stayed out in the West, uh, you know, the Black Hills, Sand Hills area, and other bands came from the woodlands, uh, from the forest. And then some bands also lived along the Missouri, Missouri River. Um, they lived, you know, near and with the uh, Mandan Hadats and the Rick and Earth Lodges. So um, there's different facets of, of cultural experiences, you know, that kind of coalesced into the modern Cheyenne. Um, so the language does have a lot of things that, um, you know, that do hearken to prior, you know, prior places um, ecologically and geographically. So, uh, and then, so, uh, so did your grandparents not speak Cheyenne in front of you due to the forced assimilation of boarding schools or, or some other cultural reason? Um, you know, my grandparents did, uh, they both attended uh, the boarding school in Busby there. So they didn't really physically leave home, um, but, you know, they did still experience that. Um, but despite that, their children, my mom and, and aunts, um, their extended relatives on that side in Busby did uh, become fluent speakers, but that really uh, was uh, the force of like their monolingual grandparents. Um, my mother's grandparents, none of them spoke English. Uh, so, you know, and they did spend a lot of time with them, the weekends and breaks, just how I did with my, with my grandparents. So they absorbed the language on, a, you know, just being in a pure immersive environment. Um, but I did just had always come to know that my grandparents always switched to English when they knew I was awake or that I was around. Uh, within listening uh, range to them. So um, I don't know how I figured that out when I was like five or six, um, but I just remember that, you know, I would get up and once I walked to the front, I just remember my little five-year-old brain was like, why are they switching languages? You know, I wake up to them hearing them speak shy and fluently, you know, and then when, I, when I'm when i in the room, it's just English, you know? So I picked that up when I was a kid, you know, and I still kind of remark at that, you know, that being at that observant there, so. Um, so in any given month, um, how many is it into just artists you typically interact with? Uh, really none, you know, like I, I met Taryn in August, um, uh, you know, Carla had invited me to his presentation there here in downtown Missoula at the museum, uh, Missoula art museum. So, uh, but generally, you know, my work at the university is just, I'm a mainline advisor, so I don't really, um, don't really, um, do a lot of this work, but, you know, I do hope it continues. I, I do give thanks to the comp, uh, campus compact team and also Carla for uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, introducing me to these events and opportunities. Uh, Cause I've worked at the UM for over three years now and this is like me finally getting involved in this work here. So uh, let's see here. Yeah, Marsha Small, so she's my relative. I do help her uh, with her, her uh, dissertation. Actually, we do some language work, um, translating new like, like uh, thesis terms, uh, academic terms into the language. Uh, we do work on that. Um, as well, you know, uh, just to help make ground her, her, her dissertation, you know, in, in the kind of Cheyenne, uh, I don't say epistemology, but, but cosmology, worldview, uh, axes, if you will. So, um, so I assume that there are, there are no words in the Cheyenne language that have no equivalent to English. Um, if so, how do you handle that? Um, you know, Cheyenne being verb-based and very compact, um, you know, most of the, the words uh, do mean other things, uh, but they have like approximate meanings in English. And so those have become like the standard translations there. So um, let's see here. Uh, do the Southern Cheyennes from Oklahoma speak the same language? Um, there are actually just a handful of fluent speakers in Oklahoma uh, today. Um, I know, I think there's like seven. There are just a few fluent speakers down there. Um, yeah, in the Southern Cheyenne, and that brings to mind. Uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Henrietta Mann, she is a retired, uh, retired uh, professor from both UM and MSU. Um, she's a fluent speaker. And so, you know, she's part of those relatives in Bozeman that, you know, fostered this environment for me uh, because, you know, she was in a Dow chair there, now retired, but she also had just spent time in the community. Um, so, you know, being around her uh, in the language, hearing her speak the language um, definitely kind of primed my uh, ability. So she was also kind of this very local person who helped uh, 
ground me with the language there. Um, you know, she did, I went to the opening of American Indian Hall uh, on the MCU campus there in October 21. You know, she led the prayer and I was just in tears uh, in the background because being able to understand her at that very high level of language of like prayers and the eloquence for those prayers, um, you know, it was, uh, it was very uh, heartwarming to hear her, her pray in the language and to be able to understand her, um, you know, definitely was a uh, Kind of relit the fire even more for me. So, oh, let's see here. Um, are there uh, university systems outside of Montana that are contributing to the health of Shine language and culture? Yeah, so I do collaborate. Uh, university of Denver. Uh, um, I do have um, a longtime college mentor, Angela Parker. She's a, a professor faculty at University of Denver. Um, you know, they have programming for this reconciliation uh, with the Shine and Arapaho people, owing uh, to the Sand Creek massacre. There, there have been a lot of uh, reconciliation movements there. Uh, going on, you know, they renamed a mountain uh, to Mount Blue Sky. So yeah, University of Denver, MSU, um, and then Chief Life College. But yeah, I, I would say outside of Montana, um, the University of Denver has definitely been a, a, one of the, the main drivers, um, along with the other universities in the Denver area to re reconcile that part of Colorado history. So. Um, how has your community addressed the issue of some individuals, both new and experienced, leveraging their language and cultural knowledge to oppress or shame others in the community there? Um, you know, I will say I left home over 20 years ago. Um, so I've kind of had this virtual modern day connection to the language through modern technology. Um, you know, I really can't answer that too much. You know, I think I will be able to answer that in a year or so once I get, in, you know, I will be returning to the community there uh, to help with this VR language project. Um, and I know we're going to have some resistance about, you know, this project because there are issues of copyright, there are issues, you know, of who owns the data, who owns, you know, who owns this indigenous data, who's in charge of it, you know, uh, how that will be leveraged. So, um, you know, with this VR project, it's a blank slate still, but we will be working through, uh, you know, through that and working with the community there. So, yeah, Dr. Henry Mann, yeah, she... All I can say is, you know, hostile on them, like many, many, many years. I hope she, you know, will still be here. Um, she has definitely helped, uh, she helped bridge, you know, and, and maintain the Shine cultural presence in Bozeman, um, you know, despite Bozeman being, you know, a good distance from the reservation there. So, so there was a question about um, these oh, recordings will be available. And so we we recorded all the sessions as mm -hmm. of last year. Um, and they are on our Centering Indigenous Knowledge YouTube. And so these ones will be posted as well. Um, but I do sincerely appreciate Dakota. Um, he's an advisor here at Missoula College and um, certainly such an asset to U of M. And, um, and so I just really appreciate sh you sharing those personal stories, um, your advocacy for language work, and the tools that you've developed. And so thank you so much for your time. And thank you Great everyone time. for for coming. Um, join us next Thursday, same time at 12. Um, and we'll be hearing from Dr. Anita Moore. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.